Welcome back, everyone. My name is Last No Meal, and today I'm really proud to announce the voice behind Geralt of Rivia, actor Mr. Doug Cockle. Welcome to the channel. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, we are having a bit of a tough year. Uh, everything has changed. So, how are you? How are you holding up? I'm doing okay, actually. I've uh, been working from home on various things. Um, I teach at university as well as being a, a freelance actor. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I've been doing some voice uh, voice recordings from my little studio. I'm talking with you right now in my little studio. Um, and I've been doing lots of uni work as well. Mm. Yeah, it definitely changed how I think productions work in 2020. It's going to be somewhat a challenge, I believe, now that um, productions are coming up from that hold and continuing to just do it. I mean, in video game industry, it's different, but in, you know, it's good that we have the tech now to do a couple of these jobs from home. Um, than we do yeah, before. absolutely. It, it is interesting though, because I think that a lot of the voice production studios who do voice production for games, um, uh, they, I think they struggled a little bit at the beginning because they don't like actors to have home studios, generally speaking, because they want, because if they, if an actor has a home studio, then um, they may very well uh, go around the, the voice studios. Um, you know, there, there are various platforms for people to get voice work online and things like that. And um, it's quite easy to do now. Um, so not, not that they didn't like that actors did it, but it, it, you know, made it harder for them sometimes, uh, I think. Um, but then they had to embrace it, actually, when the lockdown hit, because um, that was the only way they were going to get any work done, really. So um, it's been really interesting. Yeah, it's been a very interesting year. Now, I want to go back to, uh, to Geralt of Rivia. Uh, a lot of people know you from, from the Witcher game series, and I want to go back to the if you remember the first moments, maybe when you learned about the role itself and how much did you actually know about the character and the world itself? I knew nothing. <laughs> um, when Witcher 1 was being made, the, the original um, books in Polish hadn't been translated into English. Um, and I didn't know anything about the television series that had been made in Poland. Um, uh, back in the 90s, I think it was. Um, so I, everything I knew about The Witcher came to me through the writers, the producers um, for the games. So they, they uh, talked with me about who this Geralt guy is, what a Witcher is, um, the, the nature of the world that they live in. Um, so a lot of the lore I came to understand um, was through the developers themselves. Mm. Yeah, uh, and I mean, when uh, when they started explaining Geralt of Rivia in a sense, and uh, what was the inspiration behind the voice itself? Because we know how important the voice is, especially if it's a video game, and the only way a, an actor can actually portray an emotion um, through that is through the voice. So what was somewhat the, the inspiration behind it? Well, at the at the audition, um, so I showed up at an audition for, for a, a video game and it was, I knew it was called The Witcher, but I didn't know any, I didn't know what that meant. So I went in I went into the booth and a guy named Boris, um, who's one of the lead writers on, on The Witcher series, um, was there from CD Projekt. And we just kind of played with some ideas. He described Geralt a little bit to me. Um, uh, and he, he kept pushing my voice lower and lower and he kept saying, no emotion, no emotion. Uh, so I kept trying that. And then finally, he said something that kind of clicked for me. He said, um, he said, Doug, think about Clint Eastwood in the Dirty Harry films. You know, the whole, um, go ahead, punk, make my day kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the Geralt voice came from. Now, it, it, it developed from there, obviously. Um, so when we came round to the actual recording of Witcher 1, uh, there were five or six 
people from CD Projekt Red who were there at the recording sessions. And, um, uh, you know, they, they went into more depth about what they wanted from the voice and things like that. So um, we kind of more or less finalized it in that first day of recording. Mm. Yes, and it's very interesting now that you say like uh, the no emotion thing, but what we've seen throughout video games is that Geralt does show emotions through his own kind of a way, even though he tries to suppress them. So was that, was that difficult to kind of mix the, the no emotion, no a character that has little to no emotions to a character that cares about other characters like Cyrilla or Yennefer? Was that sweet spot a bit difficult to find? Well, I think, um, I mean, <laughs> in Witcher 1, they kept saying, take the emotion out, take the emotion out. And the thing is that uh, <laughs> what we as actors do is play with emotion. That's, that's a big part of our job. Um, so to take the emotion out completely is, um, is the opposite of what our, our instinct tells us. Um, so not that I disagreed with them perhaps, um, but I, I kind of felt that what I was going for was a person who didn't have no emotion. It was a person who um, had to suppress his emotion uh, because of the nature of the work that he does. Um, so that's kind of how I went about it in my own head. And, and you'll, you know, through the, through the series of games, you'll notice that, you know, Geralt does become more and more emotional mm. and he never becomes a, you know, really, really super outwardly emotional person. But um, I think as the writers, I like to think it was kind of a collaborative process subconsciously as the writers explored Geralt and his way of dealing with the world around him and the relationships that he has with the people around him. Um, I think they, they gave me a little bit more freedom in the script and I took that and ran with it. And then they saw that that could work. Uh, this is what I think. I don't know. Nobody said this, uh, but I think that they saw that, well, that can work. Um, and so they, they gave him more life in Witcher 3 than in Witcher mm. 2. Mm. And I, th I like to think that I did as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't think he ever was a, an emotionless zombie. I think that it was just a... It was certainly a task to try to find what they were looking for in Witcher 1, which was the emotionless Witcher on, on the path. Mm. True, true. Uh, that's why... That's why the voice itself became such an iconic thing tied to Geralt. Um, mm. Like people cannot really imagine Geralt of Rivia, like majority of like, let's say English speaking audiences, uh, not talking about localization, but they cannot really imagine Geralt of Rivia without that deep voice that um, was actually from the games. Um, I also saw in one of your other interviews that you play the game. So do you have a favorite quest maybe from one of the, the three games oh wow maybe as you were Favorite working quest. on um there were so many i mean this is the thing there's so <laughs> much content in the witcher um i think there was one that i particularly liked and i'm trying to remember the details of it uh, but it was it was a search for a werewolf who ended up being quite a conflicted character in himself. And um, I don't know. I just, I, I've always liked werewolves. I, I don't know. There's something about the, you know, the folklore and the, you know, the, the fairy tales and stuff like that that I've always liked. So um, I think that kind of made that particular quest uh, special for me. But it is really interesting because... Um, I think, you know, the, the vast majority of people who play The Witcher play it in, in English, but a lot of people play it in their, in their home language. And um, I've, I've had messages from people who, who've said, uh, and it's really, it's really fun and sweet and everything, who said, I really, you know, I like your performance as, as Geralt in English, but I really prefer the, the Polish actor or the French actor or the German. One, one guy said, oh, the German actor just nails it. And I'm like, great, that's great. I mean, localization's hard. 
Yes. Because they're all because they're all translating my performance into their own language and their own culture. Um, so you know, lines have to change a little bit. You know, the the way that lines are said have to change a little bit. The nature of the character has to change for the for the cultural references. Hmm. Um, I want to talk now about a bit of a acting in video games. Obviously, throughout let's say. When I was growing up and today, the technology that um, is used in video games has changed. Um, and I think with that, obviously, the, the voice acting process has changed. So do you think that um, now with all this tech that, that people, actors have, especially if it's a full motion capture that's being done in games today, um, how much how, how, how much do you think that whole process changed? Did it became a bit easier? Did it became more complicated now that, that you have, uh, especially in films like, let's say, green screens and all of that, where actors have to sometimes act alone to be later um, included with other actors? Hmm. It, it is changing for actors across the board, and especially now with the whole COVID crisis thing, where live theater events are, they just can't happen at the moment. Um, there are a lot of a lot of things shifting in in the world of acting. Hmm. In terms of games, uh, it has been an interesting journey. I mean, when I first started doing voiceovers for games, it was 1999, and it was all it was all on paper. You know, you get these scripts and some. You know, for, for Witcher, uh, I think I can't remember if Witcher Two was still on paper. I think some of it was. Yeah, it was still on paper, and you get these massive scripts through. Um, just you know page after page after page of of dialogue um but now it's most studios have gone to digital so you'll have a television screen in the studio with you in front of the microphone and the script will be on an excel spreadsheet or something like that and the director is is um uh, scrolling down through it for you from the from the control room uh, so that's a change that I've seen. And thank goodness for the trees that are saved that way. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of other things, now I've never done motion capture. I've done some facial capture. I did that for, for um, uh, I think it was for a, a Gwent um, trailer for the, for the Gwent game. And um, that was interesting. But in terms of games in general, motion capture, facial capture, and performance capture, which is both, um, uh, and, and, and vocal capture at the same time, uh, that's becoming something that um, I think is becoming more and more common um, in the development of games. I mean, you know, The Last of Us famously uh, was all performance and, and um, I'm pretty sure it was vo voice and facial capture as well. Yes. Um, and certainly the latest one was. Um, so I think that's something that, I mean, it'd be, I don't know what they've done with cyberpunk. I, I have a feeling they didn't, they did it very much like they did Witcher, uh, where actors went into the voice studio and did the voices and they had, they used motion capture for certain things. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know. You mentioned now that, uh, it's definitely changing, changing. I want to. What do you think about the future of actors in video games? Because now more and more we see a lot of actors that were not primarily, let's say, for video games. They either do theater or they do uh, films or movies or even big Hollywood productions. And they kind of switch to, to, to video games. It, I think what I noticed is that it's almost like they're kind of inspecting that area to see how it's going to work. So what are your thoughts about like the future of acting, do you think that more actors, more let's say mainstream actors, in a sense, would approach these roles for video games? Now they're they're becoming more and more popular. I think so. Yeah, I mean, when I first started doing voiceovers for video games, um, it in some ways it wasn't really considered real acting work. I, I can't tell you why. It just it just was. Um, perhaps because it was in the games industry and the games industry was looked on as something that, you know, teenage boys are involved in, not, not, you know, real world people. Um, but gradually over the years and with the, the nature of the games, I mean, the, the narratives that are being told, 
Um, even in smaller games that aren't as epic as Witcher 3 or uh, Red Dead Redemption or The Last of Us or things like that, um, where there's a really strong storyline and really well-defined characters who have real-world problems that we can all relate to. I mean, that's really important stuff. And that's, that's where actors really enjoy their work, you know, doing roles like that. But even on smaller games where the, um, the actor is just a narrator or, um, you know, does silly voices for background characters or something like that. Um, I think people, actors in general, have recognized now that for, for several years now um, that games are a very legitimate um, area of work. I mean, it, it's telling that... BAFTA, you know, the, the, the BAFTA organization here in, in uh, the UK, they have a BAFTA games arm um, because they've recognized that the art of doing games, you know, developing games, the artwork, uh, the, 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 the script writing for games, the, the narrative storytelling, um, all of that stuff is an art form in, its, in, in, its, in itself. True, true, especially because now as you said, characters in video games, they have a purpose, they have a role to be there, they have a story behind them. And even the, the authors of those video games are trying to not only make a video game, but also talk about a certain topic or send out the message, which is something that theater films and TV series do. Um, I wanna to touch on the, the topic of film and theater and video games. Um, if I'm not wrong, you were also in theater, film and video games. Um, what, what, how do you approach those projects now that are different? Like I want, maybe your thoughts on like the theater now and how much has changed and even the film industry, how much has it evolved? Well, I think the place to start with there is to say, um, I don't remember who said this, um, but it's, it's, it's understood that the processing power of computers doubles every year or something like that. It's, I can't remember exa exactly what the, the rate is, but it's massive. So if you think about just in the last 20 years, the kinds of games we used to be able to play and the kinds of games we can play now and the kinds of films that we can make and the kinds of television that we can make, it, it's completely different. And now with streaming services, I mean, you know, um, streaming services like Netflix and uh, Prime and um, uh, Disney and all of those things, they're all making their own content and they're making it quickly and they're making it well because the technology allows them to do that. So let's take, for example, the Witcher Netflix series. Um, you know, did, depending on where you come at this from, um, they, they filmed, was it nine episodes? Um, in a relatively short period of time, in about three months. I mean, there was a lot of pre-production work mm -hmm. on that, you know, the writers and everything else and getting things ready and location scouting and all of that stuff that has to happen. But the actual filming was about three months for roughly, what, 10 or 12 hours of content, something like that. Yeah. And, um, and if you think about it, the films that I've done, they spent three months filming two hours of content. So, you know, the, that's really quick filming, um, but they can do it because the technology allows them to do it. We've got, you know, really high quality digital cameras now, um, special effects that can be done uh, relatively, I, I say relatively quickly and easily, but that, you know, it, in comparison with what it used to take to do those kinds of things. So I think that's the main thing that's changed you know, the, the speed with which technology is advancing is allowing us to do things that we just couldn't even 10 years ago. Yes. Um, and, that, and, and that impacts on everybody in the industry, not just actors. Mm, true, true. And especially because uh, some actors were actually that were doing films with, let's say, green screen, and they had to do it alone. And it took a, a big toll on them because acting is supposed to be this, you know, real thing close to other actors other characters and can exchange the um the lines through that and and now that some um, actors have to do it by themselves and they have to imagine this entire let's say scene 
like for example as it is with video games there is nothing in in front of you just expl you explain the situation you have to imagine that head in that head mm. in your head uh how how difficult is that sometimes for uh, i think it's really really helpful um if the developers can show an actor an image of their character um that really helps or uh, and um and or um images of the the world that the character lives in that kind of thing can really really help just put your imagination in the right place i think it is a unique thing to to voice acting uh, for games because you do have to use your imagination in a different way when you're in theater or on 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 camera um typically you have other actors there to react to you have a costume that you're wearing that helps you feel the character you're on a set that looks like the environment where the character lives um so you have all those things kind of helping your imagination along if you're just stood in a in a <laughs> in a sound booth um with a, a a plate of glass between you and the engineer and the director um you do have to engage your imagination in a different way some people can do that and some people just can't I, I, um i haven't experienced that myself but i've talking with directors who i've worked with they have said you know some actors come in here for an audition and they just can't do it this you know they can't engage with this work in that imaginative way um and some actors can uh so i forgot what the original question was but I think that's interesting. It's kind of similar. Uh, I mean, it's, it's true for other things as well. Some actors, you put them in front of a camera and they just glow. They just, you know, they, they naturally reach through that lens to an audience. And some actors, you put them in front of a camera and they're just wooden. Hmm. Um, but they might be brilliant on stage. They might be amazing actors on stage, but they just don't come across well on camera. Or they might come across really well on camera and put them on a stage and the audience can't hear them and they don't know what to do. So mm. all actors are different and some actors are, uh, you know, just better at other things than, than others. Yes, and the, the difference when, when you're in theater, it's, it's a whole different atmosphere because mm. when, once the play starts, you're... It's almost, it, it's, it's not only that um, you as an actor are interacting with other actors or the scene behind you, there is also this certain interaction between you and the audience. And um, that's something that um, I think is kind of difficult to have in a film because it's a uh, shoot and stop and do it again. So yeah. well, where do you like the most, where do you feel the most comfortable when it, when it's, when it comes to acting? I think I feel well. I, I mean, I certainly feel comfortable in a in a voice booth now. I've been doing it long enough, and and have certainly done a lot of it. So I I don't um, I feel very comfortable in a voice booth. Um, I think I like acting. I enjoy all of it. But if I had to pick, oh no, I'm gonna I'm not gonna give myself that trap. Um, I love the theater. I've always loved theater. It's it's how I got into acting and it's how I trained as an actor. And I love that live interaction with an audience. Even if there's a fourth wall, you know, that imaginary wall between you and the audience, even if it's a fourth wall situation, I just love being able to hear them laugh when something's funny or, um, you know, I, I've had moments where I've been in a scene and something that I or one of my fellow actors has done is shocking and you can hear the gasps out in the audience and there's just something really really special about that it's a communal event it's um you know it's like going to a music gig you know people who really love going to music gigs what they like about it is not just the music it's the being together in a one place with all these people who love this music too you know it's it's communion that's what those live events give us yeah, yeah, the, the whole atmosphere of, of, of that moment. Um, yeah. You mentioned a bit Netflix, The Witcher. Um, what do you think about that show? I mean, Henry did an amazing job, and I, he said that he took a lot of inspiration from your work on The Witcher games when it comes to the voice. So what are your thoughts on the show? Well, it's, it, it was fantastic that he said that. It was really, really generous of him. Um, and um, 
I was pleased because I, I did feel some ownership over how Geralt is performed. Um, but I think what's important is that, um, well, Henry did a fabulous job. I think he, you know, he, he took some inspiration from my performance as all good actors would, um, you know, they'd go to who has performed this before. I mean, I played Benedict in Much Ado About Nothing on stage at one point. And the first place I went to, to, to steal ideas was to Kenneth Branagh's uh, Benedict in the film that he made of Much Ado About Nothing. So, you know, I think any good artist steals a little bit from those who have gone before. It's how you learn, it's how you, how you take inspiration. So he did that, but he made it his own. And I thought he did a fabulous job. And um, what was great about Henry, uh, I, I, I had the opportunity to meet him because he, he reached out to me on Instagram, sent me a, a direct message. And I didn't believe it was him at first. I sent back a thing saying, no, this isn't you. <laughs> and he said, yeah, it is, I'll give you proof. Uh, but he invited me to the UK premiere of, of the Netflix series. And um, so I got to meet him and, and we hung out for you know a good hour or so just talking, talking about Geralt and talking about our experiences of playing him. And he's a really nice guy, really genuine. And um, yeah, I think he did a fabulous job. True, true, um, definitely, yes. Uh, now, kind of a last question is, are you following a bit about cyberpunk? That's uh, what do you think about that? About the new game? What do you think about general about the universe and how much it's like it's a di to totally different story than they were doing with The Witcher? It was like the, the Middle yeah. Ages. Yeah. Well, I don't know who had the idea first, but I I don't know if you know um, The Witcher has a uh, TTRPG tabletop role playing game that's made by Art Halsorian Games, mm -hmm. and Art Halsorian Games are the people who made the TTRPG for uh, cyberpunk. Mm. Um, now, I don't, I have to try to remember exactly how this happened, but um, uh, a lot of my family live in Seattle, Washington, or near Seattle, Washington in the US. And so I go home now and then, and I had found out about Artal Saurian Games. At, um, we were doing a live stream, we were setting up a live stream, and I, I found out that Art Halsorian Games is based out of Seattle. So I went and, and, and uh, met up with them, spent an afternoon with them, which was great fun. But uh, Cody Pondsmith, who's the son of, of the founder, uh, of the founders, actually, of Art Halsorian Games, um, he, he put a proposal to CD Projekt Red when he was 16, I believe it was, to write The Witcher TTRPG. And he flew to Poland and presented his, he, he wrote the game. He wrote the game, took it to them and walked them through how it would work. And, uh, and they said, yeah, we'll have that. And um, I think that may have been the beginning of, of the relationship with Artal Sorian Games. Now, I've heard, and it may, it may have actually been on one of your, um, one of your uh, YouTube uh, postings, uh, or it may not. Um, I've heard that the, the founders and um, owners of CD Projekt Red used to play cyberpunk when they were teenagers. I, I, I seem to remember hearing that somewhere. So somewhere along this timeline, there's, there are a number of points where Artel Sloan Games and, um, and CD Projekt Red, even before they were CD Projekt Red, have, have crossed over in some way, shape or form. So um, again, I've forgotten what your original question was, but it's really interesting. I, I just thought it was fascinating that Cody uh, wrote this TTRPG when he was 16. Mm. and CD Projekt went with it. Um, so it actually makes sense. There's, um, you know, there's a long-standing relationship there between the founders of CD Projekt and Artel Sorian Games and their cyberpunk game. Mm. Uh, well, my original question was about the universe I itself. Oh, yeah. It it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's getting closer to realism, actually, which is uh, to have this dystopian universe, which was written all the way back in 1989, and to see all of those things somewhat become reality today, it's uh, a bit troubling, but at the same time, it just shows how, how these people were ahead of their time when it comes to ideas of the future and how is it 
going to be. So what maybe your, your general thoughts about that universe? I don't know. Well, I don't know too much about it yet. I haven't played the TTRPG before, um, though I'm aware of it. Um, and I've, I've only seen um, snippets of gameplay from Cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I don't know the world well enough to comment in any kind of depth on it. But what I've seen, I really like. And it, um, uh, I mean, it reminds me of, I mean, these things don't come out of nowhere. Again, you know, um, good artists steal from those who've come before. So I can't remember exactly when Cyberpunk was created by our Talsorian games. I, I think it was the late eighties. Um, but it brings to mind things like Blade Runner. Um, uh, and 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 other other science fiction, um, goth gothic punk, futuristic kind of films that were made back in the in the eighties uh, and nineties. Um, so I, I've always loved all that stuff, you know, Mad Max and you know those kinds of films and things like that. So watching the gameplay that I've seen of Cyberpunk makes me really excited to get my hands on that game. So it captured the spirit successfully of the 80s and the 90s. And I think that's, that's a bit hard to actually achieve. And, and I'm glad they did. Um, for the end, do you have any final thoughts for the, for the audience? Lots of people here um, do really enjoy playing the Witcher games. They enjoy the work. So do you have anything to say to them? Oh, I love playing the Witcher game. I haven't been on in a, in a long while now because I've been playing some other things. But um, yeah, I finished Witcher 3 and I got the ending that I wanted. I, uh, I ended up with, um, and I didn't know that I would because I couldn't remember all of the you know, different branches that you could take Geralt onto. So sometimes I was, just, well, often I was just making choices based on what I really wanted to do, not because of something I remembered from recording. Uh, but yeah, I ended up with uh, Geralt's with Triss, series A Witcher, um, and I can't remember what happens to the various kingdoms and stuff like that. But that was what I wanted. I wanted Ciri to be alive in The Witcher, and I wanted to, I wanted Geralt to be with Triss. So uh, I got that ending, um, and um, I've still got, <laughs> I've still got um, Hearts of Stone and Blood and Wine um, to play. And it's, it's on my list of things to do. So um, I'm going to get to those uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. <laughs> I feel guilty. I haven't played them yet. But um, uh, I just, you know, there have been other things I've, I wanted to get my hands on and do. And uh, because I was a BAFTA judge, uh, BAFTA games judge, two years running, I had to play all these other games because they were all nominees. Um, I couldn't judge something I hadn't played. So I, I, I was a busy boy for several years. <laughs> but what I would say to the uh, people, um, you know, fans of the Witcher universe, um, especially fans of the games, we all know CD Projekt has said that there's something else coming down the pipeline. Um, so it's not the end. It might be the end of Geralt's journey. That's that's what what seems to be um, universally understood and that seems to be what CD Projekt has said but um, you know no no doubt he'll turn up in some way shape or form um, in whatever comes next so hopefully I'll see you again thank you so much for being on the channel and I wish you all the best in the rest of the year as much as we can <laughs> say it today Oh, thank you. But just for those fans watching and listening, most importantly, just a quick message from someone we all know. I hope you've all had a fantastic time watching this. See ya.